The last decade has seen a complete shift in thinking about the kinds of homes we should be building in the UK. Changes in the planning system have encouraged more thought to be given to design. Increasingly, planners, developers and architects are thinking about not just building standard houses, but innovative homes within great new places to live. And despite the current downturn, we're still going to have to build millions of homes in the next few decades, which is a very exciting opportunity. As well as looking to the future though, it's also worth looking back at some of the most interesting housing of the past to see what we can learn. When Government Minister Nye Bevan set up the NHS in 1948, he was also in charge of a huge post-war house building programme. His aim was not just to solve a major housing crisis, but to create homes that people would be proud to live in. So he introduced a government-led design award for the best housing built in England. 60 years later, the awards are still running, as one of the construction industry's most prestigious annual events. Well, Nye Bevan was, of course, Minister of Health, because housing came under the Minister of Health. And he saw the two as very interlinked. Uh, a health service and decent housing was an integral part of the health service. Uh, therefore, to get proper standards into housing um, was, was a prime priority for him. And he founded the awards basically to, to ensure that these standards were maintained. This year, to celebrate the 60th anniversary, historic awards were given to six developments. The chosen schemes won awards in their day and have since proved to be influential. In this film, we're going to go back to look at the winners to see what made them so special and to see how well they stood the test of time. The eight houses of Highworth Cottages were designed while Britain still endured rationing after the war. The architects, Paul and Moyer, with their flair for design and detailing, teamed up with the engineer and materials expert, Eric Chick. And the resulting design was revolutionary. Simple masonry cross walls combined with timber frame between. The homes were spacious and well lit, and at a time of scarce materials and little money, they represented efficiency with slender, lean construction. But it's the small design details that made these houses so family friendly, like these side-by-side -side front entrances, one a front door leading to a living room and staircase, the other a side entrance for kicking off dirty boots and coats that go straight through to a kitchen and the garden. An elegant staircase is placed centrally, which maximises usable space around it. The wide frontage and clever continuous glazing provides excellent internal light. Internal walls can be altered over time to suit the changing needs of families. Children at the time of their life out here playing in the common and you, they had such wonderful childhood. I think there's four or five still here and of course the ones we've still sort of still very friendly with because we, when we came up here in 1953, well, beginning of 54, I mean, we all got to know one another and the children all played together. The houses were quick and cheap to build and possible to replicate on a massive scale. In fact, they formed a model for much of the housing in the 60s and 70s. Bucky Fuller said famously, Madam, how much does your house weigh? Because he saw that economy of materials meant uh, efficiency of production. Now the Highworth House weighed 120 tonnes. An average equivalent house at that time weighed 190 tonnes. So you can see the economy of scale that Paolo Moore and Eric Chick produced there. These homes are the result of a clear vision of what can be achieved in an ordinary everyday suburban terrace. The homes are well designed and cheap to build, but built to last. As we just heard, some of the earliest residents to move here in the 1950s have raised their families and are still here over 50 years later. And the homes perform as well today as it did back then. Golden Lane 
was the result of a competition-winning design from the early 1950s for a new housing estate on a site in the City of London which had been flattened during the Blitz. The developer, City of London Corporation, proposed a high-density scheme to respond to the housing shortage and they appointed the winning architects Chamberlain, Powell and Bonn. Together, they designed over 500 apartments and maisonettes in a mix of medium and high-rise buildings. But they also provided a vast array of facilities for high-density living. The result was the first truly mixed-use urban village and was completed by the mid-1960s. The, the most common type of apartment on the estate is, is a maisonette or duplex and there are six blocks of six floors worth of maisonettes. There's also one tower which is 11 storeys high and there's also Crescent House which is the one that fronts onto the main road uh, which is mainly studio apartments. So there's on the whole there's housing for single people, for families and for groups of two or three. The estate, which is now 50% privately owned, 50% affordable rent, has an excellent reputation for successful management. Uh, we're here from 8 to 5, Monday to Friday, and we also provide some cover on the weekends. So the, uh, there is always a presence, a management presence, or a state staff presence on the estate when residents need something. The residents are very involved in the running of the estate. They're, it's their decision how the estate is run, and then we just provide them with the resources. I like the fact that a lot of thought has gone into the way the houses have been designed. There are lots of really rather surprising details, like the five metre high window that opens like an ordinary sash window. There are really comfortable balconies, large enough to sit out on. And I think what's most interesting is that the architects have clearly thought really carefully about how the landscape works. It's surprisingly spacious, and despite the fact there are about 500 flats and maisonettes, it feels like a very easy place to live without feeling overcrowded. I came and looked round and I was shown little bits like the recessed um, shelving that sticks out into a street effectively from beneath the windows. All of the glass with the light running through it was just beautiful. And the way the flats seem to fold up like origami, it's a small space, a lot of small spaces, but they fold into each other in a wonderful way. It feels unusually like they've, they've managed to wander through it in their mind while they were designing it and think about how you'd open the door, how you close the door, how you could get the most out of a small space. The thing that really struck me about it was that people nowadays feel that he, they wish to impose themselves upon a building and in, when this was built there was an assumption that architects knew what was good for you and you would move into it and live in it and inhabit it that way. The estate does foster a very good sense of community. At the centre of the estate, and this is really unusual, is, is a public swimming pool, the only public swimming pool in the City of London. There's also a badminton court, there are also tennis courts, all available for residents. There's a community hall, there used to be community workshops, and there's an arcade of shops. So it's in many ways a truly socialist vision of housing which has survived. These homes are some of the most sought after in the city, and it's easy to see why. Utilitarian interior spaces with attention to detail in the design. Well-maintained, hard-wearing outdoor spaces. Great amenities and excellent management. And a sense of the community really taking pride and care in looking after the place themselves. It's one of our best examples of high-density city living. In the late 1960s, in a suburban market dominated by standard semi-detached and terraced houses, Neil Waits, with freedom given to him by a large family firm, Waits Homes, was more experimental. Following a trip to Bern in Switzerland, he was so impressed by a scheme of courthouses built on a hillside called the Halen that he commissioned the Swiss architects Atelier 5 to design for a site in Croydon. Like the Swiss scheme, the layout of St Bernard's put an entrance court and living space on an upper level, and the bedrooms were the second court on the lower level. The resulting homes are bigger than a standard semi-detached, with private outdoor spaces and the slope used to provide great natural views from living rooms. In a radical departure for the time, car parking was added underneath the buildings. Both the upper and lower courts of the houses have access to pedestrian walkways, 
So great private indoor spaces and outdoor spaces are combined with more communal areas outside. In the 50s and 60s we were building housing, um, which I was very interested in, especially from the point of view of what it was like to live there. Uh, that's some of the, one of the things that I think Neil was a pioneer in, being concerned about the social aspects of housing. But the, the point of it was to consider what life is going to be like for people living in the houses, which makes a lot of sense, even from a profit point of view, because if, you, if people are leaving your houses because they're unhappy, and you're going to be selling against yourself another time when you build another development. The Waits, I think, had the idea that it would be a sort of communal existence here. And I've nowhere else I've ever lived. Has no one known more than, say, half a dozen people uh, at all well. But here, uh, we, we know, everybody knows a great deal about everybody else, which, uh, which, on the whole, is a pleasant thing. I immensely like the large windows and the, um, uh, the light they give. One of the nice things about a place is the way in which it, newcomers are always so pleasantly surprised. They come to a rather humble outer door and then come in and express considerable surprise, A, at the size, and then, of course, B, at the outlook. There's a tremendous amount of reorganisation gone on. Um, hardly any two houses are the same when you get inside. It's quite surprising what changes there are. St so Bernard's was important because it was the first of a series of schemes which appeared around that time. Uh, which looked at the problem of combining a close-knit community with complete privacy, high space standards, uh, excellent amenities in terms of planting, recreational space. Perhaps we were just part of the beginning of that tide, you know, um, being more aware of that bricks and mortar are more than bricks and mortar. Uh, housing is, is, a, is a, a concept that covers so much of people's lives. All 21 homes sold pretty quickly. But sadly, a planned second phase, and much larger one, was a victim of the 1970s recession. Nevertheless, St Bernard's showed how clever design could combine high-density spacious homes which were economic to build. And the layout provides great privacy, but with the potential for neighbourliness, but in a very British sense, on your own terms. In the 1970s, Lord Carrington bought a site opposite his own grounds. His aim was to provide high quality housing for rent by local people, which would complement the village. But he also specified that the design should be something that people would still be talking about 200 years later. I, I don't think that one ought to copy things all the time. I have a garden over there with uh, sculptures in it, and uh, you know, they're not Venus coming out of a shell. They're con they're contemporary sculptures by contemporary people. And I think one should encourage uh, contemporary art in every way you can. I'm ashamed to say that I was responsible for those houses there, which were, I mean, they're quite nice, but they are, they're rather disgraceful to be built in, in the 1960s. And I thought I might retrieve my reputation by do, doing something rather different here. Aldington and Craig responded with a scheme which has influenced housing design ever since. The buildings were conceived around a public courtyard. Each house has got two parts, a closed element and an open element. The closed element faces the courtyard, the open element faces their private gardens. The link between the gardens and the house is glazed, which opens, so the connection is fluid. On the public side, the more closed side, they're solid, although there are windows which I call vision slots, because they're not actually at eye line, they're there to see the presence of people arriving. The shared entrance court space is very sociable. Neighbours can pass the time of day to and from their front doors. But behind are some very private spaces in gardens and patios. I spend a lot of time in my garden. I eat in my garden, sit in the garden. Some, to me, it's another room. That scheme is still very much looked to by architects who, who are building in a similar location and it's certainly freely acknowledged by many architects building today as being uh, absolutely seminal for some of the schemes that they worked on. So the design responded to the functional and contemporary requirements of the brief. But the plan also challenged the standard layout model used by many volume house builders. Your um, volume house builders approach 
as well is to start off with uh, a local authority r regulation with road, with the, a regulation turning circle, hammerhead or whatever at the end. Um, and that starts to dictate how he lays his houses out. I, I think that the, the architecture has become too academic. If every architectural student could go and spend two or three years working on a building site, with a good builder, not with a rotten one, uh, he'd learn a hell of a lot. And his yeah. attitudes towards putting materials together, which is what detailing is about, would change, I'm sure. So the materials at Light End are very traditional. Brick, timber, roof tiles and glazing. But the way they're put together and designed is defiantly contemporary, beautifully balanced and truly harmonious. No wonder it's something of a pilgrimage site for young architects. In 1980, the Abbey National Building Society ran a competition to provide 16 two-bed houses and 30 flats. Following the 1970s oil crisis, the brief specified that the affordable homes should be very fuel efficient, but at a similar build cost to standard housing. The winning scheme by a young team of architects who became PCKO came up with the first mainstream use of passive solar design for housing in England. We applied strict solar, passive solar principles, both to the layout and to the designed individual units and also internally. So for example, all um, habitable rooms with large glazing areas face the south or the west, whereas the north elevations have the auxiliary rooms like bathrooms or kitchens with smaller windows. The south facing conservatory, which is double storey and has internal connection to all the rooms of the house, accumulates the heat and that heat is distributed throughout the whole house by means of opening the doors to the bedrooms or to the living room. This is by ventilation, but also by convection. We have designed a thick accumulation wall that accumulates the heat during the day and then that heat is re-radiated during the night. The, the, the glass and the conservatory effect in the UK is, is absolutely magical. In the hot countries it would be too hot, in the cold countries it would be too cold, but in, in England it gives you the, the enjoyment of the external environment almost throughout the year and also contact with the, with the, with the landscaping, with the garden, with the terrace. The interesting thing about the scheme is its application of logic. You want an efficient house, you want privacy, you want a close-knit community, you do this. You have a series of fingers, you plant between them, they face this way. And that's a very refreshing thing to see at that time. It was, if you like, the, um, the start of a new rigour in thinking about housing, which has continued through to this day. The scheme later underwent a 12-month monitoring project of evaluations and modelling studies, which found that without the special design features, the cost of heating the homes here would be 30% higher. It also found that residents really liked the comfort and character of Spinney Gardens, and they particularly liked the conservatories. And like a lot of places nowadays, uh, there's a lot of the properties are rented out, so you've got rental uh, tenants as well. Um, but you've got quite a lot of people who've lived here for a very long time. In fact, there are two people um, who've lived here almost from day one. Uh, and I myself have been here for 20 years, uh, which I think the, the development's been here for 24, 25 years. So people do stay, tend to stay for quite a long time, and that's really quite nice. There's itself to continuity and a nice feeling. I, I think all, all around this area and around London generally nowadays, everything looks, seems to look the same. And so that makes me appreciate Spinney Gardens a little bit more because it is very unique. There had been environmentally friendly one-off houses built before this, but this was the first development on a large scale to think about using the sun's heat to reduce heating bills in the homes. It also didn't cost too much extra for the developer. So it's easy to see how significant this scheme is to the heating and housing and energy challenges we still face 20 years later. In the early 1990s, during the recession, many parts of central Manchester were lying empty. Smithfield was a jumbled collection of 19th century buildings in a bad state of repair. In other words, a very awkward proposition to take on. But the newly formed regeneration developer, Urban Splash, saw potential. 
we knew we wanted to do kind of trendy loft apartments. Um, they were just kind of coming to the to the fore in uh, Clerkenwell with Manhattan Loft Corporation. So we wanted to do something like that in Manchester, and it just happened that this building was available. And this is this is nine separate buildings that constitute a whole um, block of the city. So um, it's it's in also in the, the kind of the interesting independent end of town, the northern quarter. So there was an opportunity for retail units at ground floor. I remember sitting there on a Friday afternoon trying to get the deal completed before the weekend um, and I think it cost us a three, from memory I think it was, it was either three hundred and fifty or four hundred and fifty thousand pounds which uh, seems crazy by today's standards and probably the most expensive apartment that we resold three years later was around about that kind of mark so it gives you some idea of where the market was and it was really kind of desperate times they teamed up with architects Stevenson Bell, who began weaving the disparate group of buildings into a single, coherent residential and commercial complex. Having discovered a fantastic industrial archaeology which exists in this building, our task then was to create workable, exciting, bespoke residential apartments within a very deep plan shell. Uh, looking around the building now, uh, it's hard to imagine what kind of state the place was in. The columns that you see, the beams that you see, we didn't know they existed. The colonnade, the light well, none of that we uh, knew about until we'd stripped out the building. You know, when we started to uncover what we had here, it was clear that we could create this fantastic internal atrium and have the apartments very quiet on this side and quite noisy on the, on the outside. That, in many ways, is what makes this apartment building different. The idea of being able to create front door, dual aspect apartments, and also exploit the internal elevation to add an extra bedroom in a situation where many apartments would only have one bedroom. It was, it was ballsy. I mean, it was, there, was, there was nothing else at this end of town. And, and, and really, the, interestingly, in 1995, there was nobody living in the centre of Manchester. I mean, it seems crazy that, 13 years on, but there was nobody living here, or there were very few. There were about 200 people. There are now about 20,000, so there's been that kind of massive step forward. And really this project was the catalyst for that. This project started to engineer that kind of change. So the people who moved in here, in Manchester, were real pioneers. You know, they took a bold step. They were handsomely rewarded, but they took a bold step. This project showed that derelict commercial buildings and the areas which surrounded them could be given a new life but only with high quality design and proper investment in delivering quality spaces. This was developer-led regeneration, working with the existing urban grain. The success of the scheme kicked off housing-led regeneration, a process that has since helped transform city centres throughout the country. So all six schemes provide different lessons, but they all have one thing in common. They show how enduring developments are the result of successful collaboration between planners, architects, developers and local communities. The French have an interesting phrase for the expression we hear so often, sustainable development. They call it logement durable, which means literally durable places to live. And at a time when we're thinking so much about technology and the performance of buildings, Let's not forget the equal importance of delivering great new homes within great places that stand the test of time. As Bevan said in 1946, there is a temptation to cut standards, to reduce size, to eliminate planning and design anything for speed. But this would be a crime for which we, our children and our grandchildren, would pay for 50 years to come. It is a crime we must not commit.